you know, every time there's a closed door, God opens another door. Always know that. And um, I want to say the beginning of the year, uh, Pastor Paul and Pastor Dave heard uh, Jeremy's testimony. And uh, they came to me right away and they said, wow, this would be a good interview and so on. And I said, you know what, God, it's just not the right time yet. I just don't feel led yet. And all of a sudden this week happened. I'm like, you know what, this is what God wants. And so it's amazing. It's always awesome when we walk in the footsteps of God. Jeremy, tell us, um, where were you born, you know, and, and where did you grow up at? I was born here in Michigan. Um, uh, I was born in Lapeer. Um, I, I was lived here until sixth grade. Uh, my parents um, couldn't see eye to eye. They had a divorce. And my mom had an opportunity to uh, move to Tennessee, Spring Hill, Tennessee, and work for GM. So uh, I eventually moved. I stayed up here for a short period of time with my dad, with my wife, my sister moved there. And uh, about a year or so. And then my sister started attending this uh, private school, Christian school, Christian Heritage Academy. And um, she was just flourishing. And my mom's like, Jeremy, you need to get down here and be with your sister. So uh, I moved down there um, sixth grade until I graduated high school. And uh, Christian Heritage was awesome. I played sports, all sports, um, soccer, base, you name it, I played it. Um, I just absolutely loved it. And uh, it was just my release as a child is to stay in focus, right? And that was my first encounter with Christ, was uh, attending Christian Heritage is when I give my heart to the Lord. And Danielle, the same? And I grew up in Oxford my entire life. And my parents divorced when I was around 15 years old. And both of my brothers had decided to continue to live with my dad, but I wanted to go and stay with my mom and Leonard. And I lived with her until my junior year of high school. And at that point, I had decided I wanted to homeschool myself during my senior year so I could get a job. And I did graduate in 2003, and shortly after that is when I met Jeremy. 2003? Yes. When you met Jeremy. Jeremy, um, were you a, a wayward teenager, or did you get in some trouble as a young adult? or? A uh, young adult. Um, okay. Up until I graduated, uh, I was involved with youth and sports. I didn't actually um, start being wayward or choosing um, uh, Jeremy, what Jeremy wanted to do until after I graduated. Um, our minds justify everything all the time. So it's something that uh, when I graduated high school, um, there was, uh, I was in a delayed entry program for the Marine Corps. And um, I got in a little trouble during that point, right? That's where it started. And, uh, and it, it forced me to wait. I had a 90-day uh, wait in order to be able to go to basic. Um, during that time is when 9-11 hit. So me being the only Ross to carry on, or the last Ross to carry on my name, the job that I chose, I was going to have to change my job. So it wasn't something that I would really wanted to do. And, and then after talking about it and um, experience in the world, right, um, I chose otherwise and to um, start partying. And uh, that's where the first separation from Christ happened, to where I wanted to live for me and just, oh, I've been good. I've, I've been a good kid. You know, I'm attending a Christian school. I'm doing what God wants me to do. Um, and now it's time to let, let loose, right? And um, so during that wait, we experienced um, Nashville. And there's a huge underground rave scene is what it's called. Um, party drugs, ecstasy, them type of things. And, um, and I just started indulging, right? I started living for what um, the world being, you know, just live, you know, living for what Jeremy wanted to do. Did you find yourself in, a, uh, in trouble with the law? Yes, I did. Um, so I started running with the wrong crowd during this time. And I went from being the leader that I was in sports, captain of these teams and everything, to a following people. I, um, I just allowed myself to be deceived. And it was just it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Like, again, I, oh, I've been good this long. I, I'm OK to do that, right? So I started hanging out with the wrong crowd, and we ended up um, getting in trouble, basically. We'll kind of leave it at that, is that uh, I had a run-in with the law, um, and it ended up coming back to haunt me way later in life, which we'll get What did you that. do uh, when you ran into problems with the law? Um, basically, so there was a group of gentlemen that, so I don't know if 
people know what I'm talking about, but there's a drug called ketamine, and it's a, um, it's a rave drug, and uh, they store it in veterinarian clinics. And me and a group of gentlemen broke into a couple of veterinarian clinics to, uh, I kind of was just with them driving the vehicle type sure. of thing, and it kind of, um, everybody got in trouble, basically. Yeah. Uh, so that was, what, 2001? Um, 2001, yes, sir. Yeah, 2001, you guys got, you said married at 2003? Uh, was it? No. Or did you meet each other in 2003? We met. We met in 2003. Okay. After you met each other, here, it's 2003. You have that on your record. You meet each other in 2003. What, what happened? Did you fall in love? Did you? Yes, definitely the Lord put Daniel in my life. Um, I never lost. I, I lost sight of God in living for Christ, but I never lost my faith. The Lord has, was, has been with me from the beginning, right? Um, like I chose to make these decisions, right? Um, and basically, after all that, meeting Danielle was like um, a breath of fresh air, right? Like it's, you know, all that, the past is behind me, right? Mm -hmm. I can start a family. Um, so going back a little bit my, uh, to that point, my mom was the one that came to me and said, Jeremy, you need to get up to Michigan and be with your dad around um, a male figure, a positive role model, be someone that um, can teach you the way to, you know, raising your family, these things. Mm. So when I can't, it was, everything was falling into place. You know, I, I meet my wife, um, or would, would be become my wife, and, uh, and that was the beginning of um, this long journey, really. And it's kind of disappointing, and I, looking back at it, is I kind of corrupted my wife, and not at the time, it's interesting, yeah, and as the story goes on, we'll see that, um, but I'm glad you said it. You sort of corrupted your wife, you know what I'm saying? Because the man, according to the Word of God, is really called and to take that responsibility to lead, to be the leader. And like it or not, finally the wife ends up following many times. The children definitely end up following. Um, Something happened before you got married with you two, though. Did you have a children or a um, child? We had one child, yes. One child? Yes. Okay. And uh, when was that? Was that right before you got married? Was that... Um... It was right before. No, it would have been one years old. Okay. One year? Okay. When, but, you, when you got married? Yes. Okay. Got, yeah, when all got... And so you got married, what, 2007? Seven. Seven. 2007. 2007. And you don't want to forget that, brother. No, I don't. I don't. My youngest's birthday is the same day, so kind of makes it easy. Do you remember what day, what month? What, what do I... What, when you got married? October 27th, 2007. We didn't yeah. go over this yesterday, buddy. Yeah. So that was good. Well, we just celebrate our anniversary. So. <laughs> it kind of worked out nice. <laughs> so here you are. I met each other 2003... You, now you have a child out of wedlock. You have that bad record. You're, you're sort of taking Danielle down some bad paths. And then something happens at 2005. You're deer hunting. Take it from there. Um, I actually wasn't deer hunting. I was actually on my way home from work. Oh, but I'm sorry. it was from a tree stand. Okay. So my father calls me and says, Jeremy, I need some help. Um, we, owned, uh, we lived in Oxford at the time. Um, and he had permission to hunt on a new piece of property. So he says, uh, Marion, which is my stepmother, um, we got a real good spot. I need your help to put this tree stand up. I'm like, all right, no problem, Pop. I'll be there, you know. So I show up. Um, we're putting the stand up. And uh, we use a ladder stand and a rope to uh, hold the tension of it while the other guy bolts it to the earth, straps it to the tree. So I get up there and sit in it. It looks good. Everything is beautiful. And I'm like, Dad, this is a great spot. And so I stand up to untie the rope to the tree stand that he's holding the tension on and the tree stand breaks. So the ratchet, it was faulty nylon on the ratchet strap and I fell 25 feet. Um, uh, where did you, would you fall on your back, your front? I actually landed on my feet, which is a blessing. So that's like the first miracle in my life. Cause most of the time when you're sitting in a tree stand, you're sitting down like I am now. So the way that the tree stand broke, it, it like was like, that. what I like the best describe it would be the demon drop at, at Cedar Point, yeah. right? Oh. So that thing dropped, and if I would have been sitting down, I would have done like a nosedive, and I would have landed on my head and my shoulder and everything else. Um, by the grace of God, you're, you're I was a big guy. Up. Yes, sir. I mean, 25 feet. Yes, it wasn't. Uh, it was. It was. It was bad. And actually, 
Um, my dad and my dad witnessed it. And thank God that I was on, uh, I was in the woods and it was like, in a, it was in a big ravine like, and uh, it was real soft grass. So it, um, it basically broke my fall. I actually landed on my feet. So the doctors described it as like an accordion effect, being as that like my spine um, compressed. It's like the old movie, The Blood Sport, right? The bottom brick bust, all that force created my um, L2, 3, and 4 to have fractures in them. So um, yeah, it was, it was a, a crazy experience. I felt I was like I was paralyzed for a few hours. I couldn't feel my feet. Uh, my dad was hysterical, you know, being as, he, to see his son on the ground um, and not, can't feel his feet. You know, I can't, you know, to see, I would hate to see that with my children. What happened from there? So, um, so that was a long road of recovery. Um, that's where my wife really stepped up and uh, she had to take care of me. And when I mean take care of me, I mean um, bathroom, wash me. Uh, I couldn't lift anything over a couple of pounds for nine months. I was roughly 220 at the time. Uh, I ended up gaining like 75 pounds um, just because you can't do nothing. I was in this brace um, and just laid up, you know, at home. I couldn't do anything. Danielle was pregnant at the time uh, and working, taking care of me, you know, and that is where um, this story starts with addiction. So the doctors, um, being in the pain that I was in, um, they prescribe you, you know, you're, the, the person, the victim, or the, um, the person taking the, the drugs is just as guilty as the doctors, right? Because you're, you're wanting them, you're needing them, right? That's the lies from Satan is you need these things, right? You need, to, you need these to, um, to function because of the pain or whatever, the, you were hurt, right? You kind of like a deserve thing, right? Uh, um, that's what your mind's telling you. Like, I need these to be able to um, function, right? So um, that's where it started off with, and this is a long period of time. This, is, this goes on for roughly five years, say. And uh, that's where I found myself. Um, and it, at the point is I wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, I was... Um, I was coming home every night. I was uh, what I thought was a good father, um, taking care of my wife and you know, coming home for dinner and all this stuff. I wasn't disappearing and just going wild, man. So I think that was the biggest, how it ended up lasting so long, as far as that goes. What did those drugs, uh, what were they called? Um, it's Vicodin and Oxycontin is what the, doc is what the doctors will prescribe. Um, when you're hurt like I was, they prescribe two different types, one for breakthrough and one for chronic. So they kind of, they try to, um, they give you two different medications to react, um, to keep you out, not from pain, basically. And those drugs took you from taking those to what? Um, it led to a heroin. Uh, so basically, the doctor that I had, um, I actually went to her home, and she would write like six months in time, like January, February, March, Every, every 30 days, she'd have a prescription for me. So, um, and she was giving me way, way, she was giving me the dose that a cancer patient should have. I mean, it was a lot, right? Um, so all of a sudden, I have an appointment, I go to her house and she disappeared. The house is empty, she's totally just off the face of the earth, right? Now, I don't know if what was going on or whatever, all I know is she wasn't there anymore. And here I am as a opiate addict to the fullest extent. And when I mean that is Oxycontin, 90 milligrams are used for cancer patients. And she was given a 23 year old man, the same thing, right? So the only other um, drug that is as strong as uh, Oxycontin would be heroin, street drug heroin. And it's very easy to get. And most people that experience pain pills and these things um, that usually leads to that because um, it's the same family of drugs, I guess, if you, if you will. Um, but that is, um, that's how I was ended up um, becoming, uh, to where you would have never thought that. If you would have seen me as a high school or a graduating high school and um, just the an athlete and to see where I was, it was just, you know, unbelievable, really. Yeah, here you grew up in somewhat of a Christian home and then Christian school. I, I, in fact, I know the school that you that you went to very well, and uh, great foundation there. Now you're on heroin. You're addicted to drugs. 
Um, totally off track with God. Um, what did that What did that addiction feel like? What did it feel like to you? Um, the best way I can describe it is there's an old term like the monkey on your back, but it's a gorilla and he weighs 500 pounds, and he's you know and it's he's always there. He never goes away. Um, and it's a justification thing, like I was telling earlier, is that um, your body is so dependent on that opiate or that drug that you will, it cannot function. It will not function. And it turns you into, uh, it'll turn you into a monster, right? You are, you are, when you use heroin or any drugs, you are injecting or however you administer it to your body, Satan into your body, right? That's what you're doing. And uh, so... Basically, um, it, was, it was intense, but at the same time, like I said, I was making excuses. I was justifying every mm -hmm. action. It's, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this. You know, I, I suffered an injury. You know, um, everything's okay, you know? And that's how, uh, that's, how I, that's how I had it in my own mind that I was doing okay, right? But, um, yeah, definitely uh, the dependency is so great that you will go to any extent manipulation, steal, theft, whatever it takes. Um, I was fortunate enough to there that it didn't actually come to that part because I had a job and I was uh, a productive addict, if you will. That's the best way I can describe it because I had a family and I, I, I did it for a reason. I wasn't doing it, obviously, to make myself feel better, but you feel so, if you don't have it, you just, you can't operate. You can't walk or nothing. You're into the bathroom and it's coming out of every orifice in your body, basically. It's like the flu or whatever. And you're just the shakes and um, it's very, very intense. It's why it's so hard for people to, to give it up. So this is all going on in the beginning of your relationship. Danielle, did you get an addicted to drugs? Yes. I had a major brain surgery two years ago and my entire life I had suffered with chronic back pain from the time I was 11 years old, it would be such a chore for me just to walk to my mailbox because my back hurt so bad. And I would get chronic debilitating headaches my whole life. And I had seen numerous doctors over the years to try to figure out what was causing those problems. And they would always tell my mom, oh, um, it's her hormones or being overweight, it'll pass when she turns into an adult, but it never did. And I didn't find out that I had this condition until I was 31 years old. And come to find out I was born with it, it's called Chiari malformation. And basically my brain was falling out of my neck by eight millimeters and it was resting on my brain stem and the part of my brainstem that it was sitting on was controlling those parts of my body. So I have a 12 inch scar on the back of my head. They had to go in and basically push my brain back up in my head and remove three vertebrae to make room for it to get it off of my brainstem. But I didn't know this until two years ago. So my whole life I had suffered pain and, in, and, and up until two years, or, and so back then, uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, here you are addicted to drugs. Yeah, well, I didn't start um, using anything until my son was over a year old for the, when I first tried it for the first time. And once I had seen how, how much better I felt, that's what started me on the spiral too. And then we both were, were fully addicted very quickly. So here you are, you're addicted to drugs. You get married at 2007. Yeah. You said you get married 2007. Now, 2009 something, you go to grocery store, I believe with the children. And what did you come back to? I walked into the house with the baby in my arms and I was calling for Jeremy to come and help me bring the groceries in and he wasn't answering me. So I went to look for him and when I went to open the bathroom door, it was locked. So I'm screaming his name and he's not responding. So I instantly knew in my mind what 
I knew he had overdosed. So I went and got a credit card so I could get the bathroom door open. And how our toilet was sitting, it was very close to a wall in the bathroom. So when I came in, he was slumped over on the toilet. It's very blue, his lips. Uh, it's something that it's so hard to describe because just the color of somebody's skin that it can turn that blue so quickly, it's, you almost go in shock when you see it. And so I started slapping him in the face to try to get him to come out of it, and he wouldn't. So I ran and got my phone, and I called 911. And they came, and it all happened so quickly. They grabbed him off the toilet, and they threw him on the bed, and they were cutting his clothes off of him. And they gave him a shot of Narcan, and it didn't work. So here, I'm like... And Narcan, is that the shot here? Yes. So I see the, the paramedic heartbeat. just, I mean, he just went in for the kill, you know what I mean? And Jeremy didn't respond. And it had been a good few minutes at this time that he had been that blue. So I just started screaming and panicking. They pushed me out of the bedroom because I think they were scared that he wasn't going to come back to. So it's pretty much at this point, he was dead. Yeah, definitely for at least a minute or two. So they pushed me out of the bedroom and within a couple of minutes, here he comes walking out and come to find out they had given him a second shot and that had worked. Unbelievable. God has been on your side for a long time, brother. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, overdose, he walks out. He's still addicted to drugs. You're probably, I think, still addicted to drugs yeah. at this point. Now we're into 2009 or 10, if I'm getting the stories right. You and mom started to mess, mess with something that the Bible says you never go to. Tell us about that. Well, because I had never grown up in the church, I had only done maybe a couple of Bible studies with my mom ever. I knew who God was, but I never had a relationship. I had never prayed to him. It was the very beginning for me. And my mom and I started watching this psychic named Sylvia Brown on television. And she taught everybody that we all had our own spirit guide and that you could put out a tape recorder in your bedroom and basically speak to your spirit guide. And I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. I want to do that. So me and my mom went and bought a tape recorder and put it out in my bedroom. And I woke up the next morning and checked it, and there was voices on it. And my mom could hear the voices. Everybody that listened to that tape recorder could hear the voices on it. Voices talking back to you? Yeah. It would just be like one word here, like hello or um, their name or, or whatever. So I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. We're going to keep doing it. And day after day, there would be more words on the tape recorder. It started to be sentences. But then it turned into where only I could hear it and nobody else. And then it, I think I had ho opened the door so big that they were in my mind because it started with one and then it turned into seven voices. And... Each one was so different and so distinct. And first I thought, well, this is cool. Now I'm like a psychic. I'm going to be rich and famous from this. And they started out nice, and it quickly, it quickly turned so evil and, and basically took hold of my life completely from that moment. Did you notice something here? I just spoke a, f a few weeks ago about um, how... I took, I don't know if you remember when I had the broom, and I said that Jesus said himself that if the room isn't occupied by him, the demon will go out and get seven more, more evil spirits than um, was there previous. 
when we were going over this this week and she shared that, she's the one that said seven spirits, seven demons. That is exactly what Jesus said. I don't understand. Um, all I know, I don't understand the number. All I know is that's what Jesus said. It's just interesting that's what you said. Also, Mary Magdalene, the one that gave her heart to Jesus and followed Jesus and the first one at the tomb was a woman because all the men were scared to death, okay? Was a woman. And it was the woman that had, that had, the Bible says, seven demons in her that God, Jesus cast out. But you started hearing these voices tell us about like, I believe you said you were like in bed one time and physical things started happening to you. Yes. And keep in mind with the number seven, I didn't know any of this from the Bible at the time. I just knew that there was seven voices and they would move things around the house. Um, twice our coffee pot got thrown off of the counter I would get physically punched in the stomach by them. They would move our curtains. Um, For the most part, I could only hear the voices, but when they did things around the house, everybody else could hear that. And one time my mom was over and it had sounded like every single window in our entire house had broke at one time. And my mom was so petrified that she left because she was so scared. And then other times we would hear, it would sound like a heavy man walking up the steps or the sound of like a cat's meow and we didn't have a cat. And it got worse from there. And um, they turned very evil. Like I would get pulled off of my bed and it got so bad because I had opened the door so big that everything that I looked at, I could see their faces. The television, the bed, It was just, imagine the most scariest movie you have ever watched in your life. Imagine seeing that 24 hours a day, seven days a week in absolutely everything you do. And then they would tell me, like, if I didn't do what they said, they were going to hurt my kids. And because I had no clue, I, I believed every single word of it, basically. So I did everything that they said. Did they tell you to commit suicide or anything like that? Yes. They told me to throw myself in front of a semi-truck, and I did try, but I could not get the door open. So... That was an angel not allowing you to get that door open. Exactly. So then they told me to um, grab a pair of scissors, and I had tried to stab myself in the heart multiple times. I had a six inch round bruise on my left breast for over a year. That's how long it took to heal. And I could never fully get it to break the skin. I was, I was too scared to do that. And the morning after that had happened to me is when everything had stopped. The, the voices, everything had went away. You didn't have a church background, nothing like this. You weren't a Christian a God follower. Jesus follower, and then, but you knew enough to take a certain book when you would hear these voices and put it on your chest. What book was that? It was the Bible, and I actually had like five of them laying all, all over my body because in my, at that time, I believed that that was like my protection. Plus, Jeremy had grown up with a Christian background, so he was praying for me. My parents were praying for me. We had multiple pastors come in. Everybody was blessing the house. Nothing was working. And I knew that the only resolution, it it had to start with me and my relationship with the Lord. And once I started praying to God, begging him to please take this away, uh, he answered my prayer that night. Because you woke up that morning. Yes. And it was gone. Yeah, you told me it was totally gone. Mm -hmm. It was gone. But there were still some things going on in your lives, in your marriage and so on. And then something happened between 2011 and 2013. Uh, Something caught up with you, Jeremy. 
Yeah, so when we first started speaking, um, I brought up about getting in trouble, the breaking and entering. Um, it came back to haunt me later in my life uh, because of the severity of it, open cases, that type of thing. Um, so literally nine years later, um, for a long story short, I had to pay the consequences for something I did when I was 19, which was a blessing. It's what saved my life. Um, the Lord, uh, I went to prison, basically. And from tw uh, 2011 to 2013, I was extradited to Tennessee, where I grew up. And um, I had a long, needed time to rekindle my relationship and to really, really um, seek the face of God. It was almost a God thing. It was definitely a God thing, oh, wasn't no, it? For sure, without a doubt. Yeah. And then being down south is, um, and we were, uh, the Bible Belt was where I grew up. So um, every night in our pod, we had church, right? Um, every single day we would, whatever day of the, so the Proverbs is 31 Proverbs. So whatever day of the month we'd read a proverb and then somebody would pick a Psalms and it was, it was awesome, right? And I had that time to, to just focus on what I was not going to do um, when I got out, for sure. Um, you get out of prison now, full of the Holy Ghost, full of Jesus Christ. Did you see a difference in his life? Oh, tremendously. It, it wasn't even the same person. <laughs> you know, tell us, the last two years you've been coming to Gateway. And Jeremy, tell us about what gateway means to you. Um, it's hard to describe with words, really. Um, basically, uh, when we moved to Emily City um, two years ago, um, you know, you drive up 53, and there's multiple churches to choose from, right? And uh, so Danielle and I were like, oh, this one looks good, okay. We were looking at Heritage Church down the street. We seen gateway off to the, in the distance, and... Like, okay, we'll just go pick a Sunday and just start going. And where we feel led, um, that's where we're going to go. And uh, it didn't take but a couple of minutes to hear you preach. And um, just walking in, the, uh, I say it all the time when I post on Facebook, is the Lord is in this place, right? Amen. And um, the, it's, just, it's just a huge blessing for me and what it's done for uh, my family and uh, the youth ministry here. And even though I don't know Pastor Dave and uh, all the youth pastors, like personally, they know who I am or whatnot, but just that connection that Christ, the Holy Spirit, and we have as the body of Christ, um, I just connect. I don't even have to speak with you. I know, you know, our the Spirit is speaking. And um, a, a gateway allows to do that. It, it, we, um, we're able to serve the communities. We're able to love on people. And that's what we're called to do. Um, my, one of my favorite verses is Proverbs 27, 17 is, um, iron sharpens iron where one man sharpens another and uh, that's what it's about and that's what we're here today for is to uh, hopefully help somebody because um, the Lord will find you in any place where you're at no matter where you're at the dumps prison addiction mm -hmm. depression anxiety anything that you're facing um, he, he'll meet you there Danielle tell us what what uh, since prison and you know, last two, five years, what kind of man this is that you live with now? Jeremy is such a hard worker. I'm gonna get worked up. You're in good company, girl. We all cry up here. <laughs> He's a totally different person and If it wasn't for him, I don't know if I would know the Lord. So I thank him very much for that. <laughs> but he's a dreamer and he throws his heart into everything that he does wholeheartedly. And he loves his kids and he loves me. And I'm just so glad that we're, we're living for the Lord now and not, and not Satan and, um, we're living in victory, as he always calls it. And just life is so much better when you live for God. Just just don't ever lose sight because... God gave you three words to tell the people. I've been praying really hard for the last three days, and he gave me three words, which is don't lose sight. 
because we all go through battles, big or small, it doesn't matter, but we all go through them. And it's not our strength that pulls us through, it's God's strength. And the more that we go through this life living how we want to, we miss out on so many opportunities to let him showcase his strength through us. So like Jeremy said, whether you're facing addiction or depression or prison or spiritual warfare, it doesn't matter. Just don't lose sight of God. That is awesome. Give it up for them. You may be seated. People need to hear what Jesus Christ is just dying to do in our lives. He's just, he loves us so much. John 10, 10 says, the thief's purpose, meaning Satan's purpose, is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus' purpose is to give rich and satisfying life. His purpose is to bless our lives. His purpose is to bring joy to our lives. And you said it, don't lose sight. So simple. People don't lose sight. We can go through a virus. We can go through hell and high water, but Jesus is still Jesus. Don't lose sight of that which Jesus wants to do in our lives. He wants to give us purpose. He wants to give us a rich life. And I'm not talking about money, a rich life. I'd rather have joy, peace any day than a trillion dollars in my bank account. Because this world is not satisfying. Don't lose sight of the rich and satisfying life that Jesus Christ wants to give us. If you're on the broadcast right now, if you're in this room and you hear my voice, please hear it very strong. When those words come to you and they say, commit suicide, that's not God, that's a demon. Those are darkness. Call it the way it is. Tell them, tell them who you belong to. Don't get caught up into it. Just tell them who you belong to. You said something when we were talking earlier, Danielle, that a nurse told you when your family put you in a mental, because that's one thing she didn't say. They put her in a mental institution. And a nurse told you that 94% of people in the mental hospital are spirit, have spiritual battles not mental illness 94 percent and i believe that because the demons the darkness they have come to kill steal, steal and destroy what god is wanting to do in your life and so i encourage us all i encourage us all christ followers those that don't know jesus i encourage us in the name of jesus christ let's give the devil a black eye Amen. Amen. I just want us all to stand up in this place. And I want us to speak out the words that are so powerful and so strong that when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, I tell you, demons shudder, demons shake in their boots. They, they get scared to death. And after this prayer, I want us to sing out this song strong and declare who we are in Jesus Christ. Just say this after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I declare you as my king, as my Lord, and as my God. Thank you, dear Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, dear Jesus, for your resurrection. 
And thank you, dear Jesus, for, for changing me from the inside out. In your precious name. And everybody said it. God is in this Amen. place. Let's give it up to yes, Lord.